one of the ways that Claude has been getting more and more powerful is it's now able to do some agentic stuff. Um, computer use, uh, there's also an analysis within the sandbox of Claude.ai itself, but let's talk about computer use. That seems to me super exciting that you can just give Claude a task and it, uh, it takes a bunch of actions, figures it out, and has access to the your computer through screenshots. So can you explain how that works uh, and where that's headed? Yeah, it's actually relatively simple. So Claude has has had for a long time, since since Claude 3 back in March, the ability to analyze images and respond to them with text. The The only new thing we added is those images can be screenshots of a computer. And in response, we train the model to give a location on the screen where you can click and or buttons on the keyboard you can press in order to take action. And it turns out that with actually not all that much additional training, the models can get quite good at that task. It's a good example of generalization. Um, you know, people sometimes say if you get to low Earth orbit, you're like halfway to anywhere, right? Because of how much it takes to escape the gravity well. If you have a strong pre-trained model, I feel like you're halfway to anywhere uh, in, ter in terms of in terms of the intelligence space, uh, 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 and 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 so actually it didn't it didn't take all that much to get to get Claude to do this, and you can just set that in a loop. Give the model a screenshot, tell it what to click on. Give it the next screenshot, tell it what to click on, and and that turns into a full kind of almost almost three D video interaction of the model. And it's able to do all of these tasks, right? You know, we we showed these demos where it's able to like fill out spreadsheets. It's able to kind of like interact with a website. It's able to, you know, um, it's you know, it's able to open all kinds of you know programs, and different operating systems, Windows, Linux, Mac. Uh, uh, so uh, you know, I think all of that is very exciting. I, I will say, while in theory. There's nothing you could do there that you couldn't have done through just giving the model the API to drive the computer screen. Uh, this really lowers the barrier, and you know, there's 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 a lot of folks who 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 either you know kind of kind of aren't aren't are, you know aren't in a position to to interact with those APIs, or it takes them a long time to do. It's just the screen is just a universal interface that's a lot easier to interact with, and so I expect over time this is going to lower a bunch of barriers. Now. Honestly, the current model has there's there it leaves a lot still to be desired. And we were we were honest about that in the blog, right? It makes mistakes, it misclicks, and we we, you know, we were careful to warn people, hey, this thing isn't you can't just leave this thing to, you know, run on your computer for minutes and minutes. Um you got to give this thing boundaries and guardrails. And I think that's one of the reasons we released it first in an API form rather than kind of, you know, this, this kind of just, just hand it, just hand it to the consumer and, and give it control of their, of their, of their, of their computer. Um, but, but, you know, I definitely feel that it's important to get these capabilities out there as models get more powerful. We're going to have to grapple with, you know, how do we use these capabilities safely? How do we prevent them from being abused? Uh, and, and, you know, I think, I think releasing, releasing the model while, while, while the capabilities are, are, you know, are, are still, are still limited is, is, is very helpful in terms of, in terms of doing that. Um, you know, I think since it's been released, a uh, number of customers, I think, uh, Replit was maybe, was maybe one of the, the, the most, uh, uh, quickest, quickest, quickest to, quickest to deploy things, um, have, have, you know, have made use of it in various ways. People have hooked up demos for, you know, Windows desktops, Macs, uh, uh, you know, Linux, Linux machines. Uh, so yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been very exciting. I think as with, as with anything else, you know, it, 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 it comes with new exciting abilities. And then, 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 you know, then, th then with those new exciting abilities, we have to think about how to, how to, you know, make the model, you know, safe, reliable, do what humans want them to do. I mean, it's the same, it's the same story for everything, right? Same thing. It's that same tension. But but the possibility of use cases here is just the the range is incredible. So uh, how much to make it work really well in the future? How much do you have to specially kind of uh, go beyond what's the pre-trained models doing? Do more post-training RLHF or supervised fine tuning or synthetic data just for the agent? Yeah, stuff? I think speaking at a high level, it's our intention to keep investing a lot in you know making making the model better. Uh, like I think I think. Uh, you know, we look at look at some of the you know some of the benchmarks where previous models were like, oh, it could do it six percent of the time, and now our model could do it fourteen or twenty two percent of the time. And yeah, we want to get up to you know the human level reliability of eighty ninety percent, just like anywhere else, right? We're on the same curve that we were on with Sweebench, where I think I would guess a year from now the models can do this very very reliably. But you got to start somewhere. 
So you think it's possible to get to the, the human level, 90% uh, basically doing the same thing you're doing now, or is it has to be special for computer use? I, I mean, uh, it depends what you mean by, by you know, special and special in general. Um, but, but I, you know, I, I generally think, you know, the same kinds of techniques that we've been using to train the current model, I, I expect that doubling down on those techniques in the same way that we have for code, for code, for models in general, for other kit, for, you know, for image input, um, uh, you know, for voice, uh, I expect those same techniques will scale here as they have everywhere else. But this is giving sort of the, the power of action to Claude. And so you could do a lot of really powerful things, but you could do a lot of damage also. Yeah, yeah, no, and we've been very aware of that. Look, my my view actually is computer use isn't a fundamentally new capability like the CBRN or autonomy capabilities are. Um, it's more like it kind of opens the aperture for the model to use and apply its existing abilities. Uh, and And so the way we think about it, going back to our RSP, is nothing that this model is doing inherently increases, you know, the risk from an RSP, RSP perspective. But as the models get more powerful, having this capability may make it scarier once it, you know, once it has the cognitive capability to, um, you know, to do something at the ASL three and ASL four level, this, this, you know, th th this may be the thing that kind of unbounds it from doing so. So going forward, certainly this modality of interaction is something we have tested for and that we will continue to test for in our RSP going forward. Um, I think it's probably better to have, to learn and explore this capability before the model is super, uh, you know, super capable. Yeah. And there's a, a lot of interesting attacks like prompt injection, because now you've widened the aperture so you can prompt inject through stuff on screen. So if, th if this becomes more and more useful, then there's more and more benefit to inject inject stuff into the model. If it goes to a certain web page, it could be harmless stuff like advertisements, or it could be like harmful stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, we've thought a lot about things like spam, captcha, you know, mass camp. There's all, you know, every, every like, if one secret I'll tell you, if you've invented a new technology, yeah. not necessarily the biggest misuse, but but the the first misuse you'll see scams, just petty scams. Like yeah. you'll <laughs> just 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 it's it's like it's like a thing as old people scamming each other. It's it's this it's this thing as old as time. Um, and and yeah. and it's just every time you you, you got to deal with it. It's almost like silly to say, but it's it's true. Sort of bots and spam in general is a thing as yeah. it gets more and more intelligent. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's uh it's just harder, harder just, there are a lot of like like I said, like there are a lot of petty criminals in the world. And 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 you know it's like every new technology is like a new way for petty petty criminals to do something, you know, something stupid and malicious. Uh, is there any ideas about sandboxing it? Like how difficult is the sandboxing task? Yeah. We sandbox during training. So for example, during training we didn't expose the model to the internet. Um, I think that's probably a bad idea during training because, uh, you know, the model can be changing its policy. It can be changing what it's doing and it's having an effect in the real world. Um, uh, you know, in, in terms of actually deploying the model, right, it, it, it kind of depends on the application. Like, you know, sometimes you want the model to do something in the real world, but of course you, you can always put guard, you can always put guardrails on the outside, right? You can say, okay, well, you know, this model's not going to move data from my, you know, model's not going to move any files from my computer to, or my web server to anywhere else. Now, when you talk about sandboxing, again, when we get to ASL4, none of these precautions are going to make sense there, right? Where when you, when you talk about ASL4, you're then, the model is being kind of, you know, you're, there's a, a theoretical worry the model could be smart enough to break it, to, to kind of break out of any box. And so there we need to think about mechanistic interpretability about, you know, if we're, if we're going to have a sandbox, it would need to be a mathematically provable sandbox. You know, that, that, that's, that's a whole different world than what we're dealing with with the models today. Yeah. The science of building a box from which uh, ASL4 AI system cannot escape. I, I think it's probably not the right approach. I think the right approach, instead of having something, you know, unaligned that, that like you're trying to prevent it from escaping, I think it's, it's better to just design the model the right way or have a loop where you, you know, you look inside, you look inside the model and you're able to verify properties. And that gives you a, an opportunity to, to like iterate and actually get it right. Um, I think, I think containing, uh, c containing bad models is, is, is much worse solution than having good models.